Maggie Oliver used to be a detective in the Greater Manchester Police and um, during that time she got involved in the Roch Rochdale grooming gang scandal uh, and she became so incensed by what was going on that she ended up resigning. And she's now set up the Maggie Oliver Foundation and has gone through hell really between leaving the police force, in fact some of the time she was in the police force and, and getting out of that and then setting up this organisation. She's got a real story to tell. And she's really trying to speak up for people who don't have a voice, whether they be the girls, like those who are caught up in the Rochdale scandal, or men or women who are suffering abuse and who need support and help. Maggie, tell us a little bit about the um, the public inquiry. I think it was September, October next last year, wasn't it? You attended, I read about it in the newspapers and I heard a little bit about it because you were interviewed as well. But you were due to, or you thought you were going to give evidence, is that right? Yeah, yeah, no, that, that is right. Um, I mean, my, my outlook is that if I'm not prepared to help and contribute to these kinds of inquiries, then I have got no right to criticise or condemn um, when I don't agree with the yeah. recommendations or results. So I was approached perhaps a couple of years ago um, and asked whether I would consider being um, a witness for the, the ICSA, the Independent Inquiry into Child Sexual Abuse ICSA um, Inquiry. Yeah. And it was being chaired by Baroness Jay, who had been very vocal in her criticism of, of the Rotherham grooming scandal. Mm. And I was approached by a legal team and so I agreed to do my best to contribute my voice to the inquiry. Um, so I spent almost two, well, 18 months putting together a, a statement of about 60 pages which went into great detail about my background and about the work that I'd done um, and also where I feel um, from my experience that the, the, the gaps in the system are and where improvements can be made in the criminal justice system. Um, now, right from the very start, I became aware that the areas that this uh, strand of that inquiry, which was looking into organised networks, ICSA, mm. as your listeners probably know, has had lots of different... Um, um, chapters yeah so they've looked at abuse in the catholic church they've looked at um abuse in football they've looked they've looked at abuse in, in in various institutions um and this was looking at abuse um in organized networks and obviously my background that what people know me for is my background in grooming gangs organized networks um so i thought that my my voice was was valuable to that um to that inquiry. Um, but from the very, very start, I became aware that the areas that were being talked about and selected for this strand of the inquiry were just not the right areas to be looking at. Whilst I could accept that we would look at somewhere like South Wales um, as, as a, an alternative, the vast majority of the grooming gangs operate in the north of England. So yeah. If you think of any, any place where you would have thought of, a, of the organised networks, the grooming gangs um, operating, you would think of Rotherham, of Rochdale, of Huddersfield, of Middlesbrough, of, you know, I guess Telford. There's one or two places in other areas. There was Oxford as well. Yeah, and Bristol. Was, Bristol. But yeah. it was just so very, very obvious that the areas that had been selected were not areas where anybody would connect grooming gangs with. And that, for me, was um, was an omission. Um, so what I were the... That... Sorry to interrupt you, Maggie, but give us a couple of examples of the kind of places that were included then. Can, can you name any? At, or... um, they looked at Tower Hamlets. Um, there was, I can't even remember. There was... Um, I think it was Swansea. And, and even when, when the, you know, the, the chief of police came and gave evidence there, I think he said that they'd had six cases of um, child sexual abuse in, in the previous year. And, you know, as a, as a core participant, I was able to listen 
to all the evidence of all the institutional witnesses. Um, now, I put together a statement, my statement was about 60 pages long, that was done with the full um, assistance and cooperation of my legal team. It was a very detailed statement. Um, and I was pretty shocked, first of all, to realise that it wasn't going to be read into evidence because um, we were we were told that we would be able to most likely give verbal evidence. Then, and it wasn't just myself. There was me. There was Harriet Wistrich, who is a very very well respected lawyer. <coughs> lawyer. Yeah. Um, and she set up the Centre for Women's Justice. Mm -hmm. There was Parents Against Child Exploitation. That there were a couple of other non institutional witnesses who had been granted. Um, core participant statement Ev uh, status every other witness was a representative from the police from social services from the cps from what i would say are the organizations that are responsible for this problem in the first place mm. and yet they were given a platform to say what a fantastic job they were doing and my personal <laughs> opinion don't you think maggie is, that that's that's the explanation what you've just said is indeed the explanation I do. I, I believe, um, as I've seen time and time again, that there is a, a real um, determination to treat the public as though they are idiots, you know, to cover up the real truth, to try and pretend that these things aren't going on, uh, not to open up the, the box, look in it honestly and truthfully and look at where we're going wrong and address it. And so I constantly find myself trying to justify what is happening um, when opposed with institutions who are saying that everything is now fantastic. Yes, in the past things were bad, but now things are better. And from my work with my charity, with the Maggie Oliver Foundation, where we are supporting um, survivors and victims of abuse every single day and have been for two years the polar opposite is the truth well, things actually think, haven't changed very much I was going to say to you Maggie can't we say that this you know even today it's carrying on still massively yeah I mean you only have to look at the all the media coverage last week of Rochdale again which is the case that I'm most well known um, through because as your listeners probably know, I resigned from my yeah. from my job in, as a as a detective, working on that Rochdale case because what I saw was just not it it was just not right. The way these children were being abandoned um, was, in my opinion, gross criminal neglect. And even though I did my very best to speak that truth and be heard whilst I was still a serving police officer, I, I spent 18 months fighting to be heard. It, it just became crystal clear that nobody wanted to hear what I was saying, even though they knew that what I was saying was the truth. So I had to resign. And then obviously I spoke out publicly. And then I worked for four years to bring the drama Three Girls to, yeah. the, the, you know, to, the, yeah. to the screen. So the, the whole country now understands grooming, knows what it is and there is no hiding from that reality so i think the authorities had to finally acknowledge that this was going on but i still find a reticence in them to acknowledge and accept that we have a long long way to go in dealing with this that the way we deal with these children is still um really patchy um there's a lot of victim blaming that they're not listened to properly that police forces and the criminal justice system are not prepared to put the resources in to thoroughly investigate and prosecute these offenders. And I thought that the ICSA inquiry at the beginning um, was an attempt to look at why that was. But what I found was um, really that wasn't the case. I just saw it as another um, attempt to filter the information and to only allow a very selective um part of the picture be painted and you know they had a couple of victims who actually gave verbal evidence which i was allowed to listen to um live as as i was a core participant and i won't say where those uh, where those young women were from 
except from to say they were from the north of England. They mm. were from the towns and the cities that the public would expect this inquiry to look at. And for me, that was very telling that they're concentrating on lots of other areas. And yet when it comes to the 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 accounts of the actual victims, they have to go back to the areas that we we know the these crimes are um, are, are, are very prevalent. So we're, I, Maggie, we're um, we, 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 we've been talking to a number of people over the last couple of months and the recurring theme we keep coming across is this thing about people not being listened to. There seem to be some groups of the public who don't get listened to for whatever reason. And it's, maybe it's different reasons for different groups because a, a lot of the discussions we've had is with, with men feeling that they're not being listened to as, as you know, in the divorce courts or in you know, issues court. about family court or in the issues about child contact but here we've got children and you know a problem which because the the issue in the family court seems to be that women have the priority you know that that there's a kind of idea that men are the abusers and women are the victims now here we have girls children children who who are also silenced and people trying to speak up for them being silenced and it's a very it's very hard to understand what's behind that what why why would that be happening who's you know I, what's I've the political myself, reason or, yeah i mean I, i've asked myself that question many times and I, I think i think i would take it right back to the start of my journey for me the law is the law and it is not the job of the the police the lawyers the courts to make uh, a judgment it is for us all to to follow the evidence to look at the evidence and and what i found with with the grooming gangs and and in many cases in the family courts is that there is a, a presumption of guilt or innocence before they even listen to what has yeah. happened mm-hmm. and i think that the parallels are um unavoidable you know that that people go into this process with a i think i think the word is a hypothesis they, they go in mm. with a hypothesis and then well the hypothesis you you test a theory is yeah. something you've already decided so a hypothesis is generous because you're suggesting well, they're well, yeah, open maybe, to testing they start it, with yeah. an idea and yeah. then any evidence that doesn't fit into that idea yeah. or theory yeah. it yeah. Is, is brushed aside and so it's confirmation and bias up. Mm. It's a confirmation bias. Yeah. yeah. So whether it's in the family courts, where I mean, in, in the foundation, we are helping men as well as women. For me, sure. a, a victim or a survivor, um, it, it doesn't matter. It, it doesn't matter their ethnicity. It doesn't matter their background. It doesn't matter their gender. You know, this is about the law. Yeah. It's about um, equality. It's about integrity and honesty. Um, and I feel there are things that we have lost in the criminal justice system. You know, it, it, you don't have to be, you know, um, Einstein to know pretty much what's right and wrong. And if you have got a child of 12 or 13 who is being raped on a daily basis by a man who's 40, 50, 60, that well, to I... me is just wrong. You don't have to be a police officer or a lawyer. Of course not. To know of course not. That is wrong, and what I have increasingly found, or you know, is that there is these these children who are very often from very difficult backgrounds are judged before they open their mouth. They aren't listened to. They're easy to dismiss, and they are powerless to be heard. So in in the Maggie Oliver Foundation, we are advocating for them. So somebody who feels very alone, who doesn't have anybody to guide them, to fight their corner, to help them mm, get through. Yeah, navigate, Mm. that's the word. To help them navigate the the system. We're there to help them on that process. And and what I feel is that there is strength in numbers, but... um, you know, in the police, you, 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 when you went to a domestic, you would divide and, and conquer. You would separate people. And all these individual victims and people who are being failed are all separated. They're very yeah. vulnerable. They're very isolated. And it needs organisations like ours and like other, uh, like Parents Against Child Exploitation, um, that know the rules, know the law, know what a victim can 
fight for and what they're entitled to. And without that person, that stranger to fight their corner, very often... Um, no one else they, will. Nobody else does. And, and they're <sighs> just... And it's the same in the family court. I mean, that is even worse in certain respects because that is secret. You know, the, you know, and I have supported and, and I still support um, some um, parents who are fighting in the family courts and are, have their hands tied behind their backs. Um, I mean, I, I became involved in one case and I actually even got um, a, a very threatening letter telling me not to get involved. So th these are the lengths that those in power will often go to to silence uh, a voice that they don't want to hear but I think we have to stick together you know we have to find a way to be heard and yeah. they don't want to hear it they don't want to hear the voices because it's going to disrupt society I mean I can understand to some extent the grooming gangs there's a concern about race allegations and people are concerned about social the social impact of being truthful about what was going on um, I don't know if you agree with that as a reason no, why no, people were behaving actually, like that I actually massively disagree. Oh, right. That's me, interesting. Yeah, for me, the law is the law. Mm. And we don't pick and choose which man we choose with to charge with rape because no, of the colour of his skin. Yeah. And we and, and by doing that, what we are saying is that you've got a free a free pass to abuse any child you want. Sure. We have to we have to be um um the, the law has to be equal. We cannot um be what's i forgot the word pandering we, we can, pandering yeah, to we, we uh, can't choose which um which person we charge with rape and which we don't if we have this is what i'm saying about following the evidence mm. if we have the evidence we follow that evidence and regardless of ethnicity uh, religion race a child abuser is a child abuser and you look at the catholic church you know and i it's not because I, you know, for me, somebody's entitled to the religion and there are good and bad people everywhere. But if we have a Catholic priest who abuses a child, he is a paedophile and for me he goes to prison. Yeah. yeah. The same with Jeffrey Epstein or Jimmy Savile or, you know, whether or Prince Andrew for that matter. You know, mm. the law should be equal. And what I see is that that is not the case. And the powerful wash the, the less powerful because yeah. they are able to and that equally um is evident in the family courts you know but i i don't think it's just with the grooming gangs i don't think it's just ethnicity ethnicity i do think that there is a class oh, yeah. attitude going on here i think it's those in positions of power um dismiss those who are seen as an underclass yeah um and that for me is what i can't stand by and accept because you know a child who's being abused it doesn't matter whether it you know whether it's chief constable's daughter or a, a child living in a in a in, in a children's home for me they deserve to be protected and that those without a, a very strong family who don't come from you know well-to-do backgrounds and go to fancy schools they need protecting even more. And yeah, a society they do. that turns their back on those children, for me, is not a society that I want to live in. And, and you know, I will fight with the, the last breath in my body for that principle. Uh, I don't you... care what anybody else says because I, it, I will never change my mind with that. <laughs> mind you, it does go the other way as well that, that wealthy families that abuse their children also, you can't protect their children because they're able to marshal an enormous amount of support to, um, you know, to prevent any intrusion on their secret family life. No, so it does go both ways as well, doesn't it? That there's, there's but but if, you, if you adopt the principle that the law should be equal... Of course. ...then that would be irrelevant. I mean... Of course. Yes, it, would, it should you know, be irrelevant, shouldn't it? That's how it should be. Yeah. And, you know, and yeah. that's what... It, it, that isn't what we see, you know? I mean, I, I could refer to... I don't know. You, you could refer to the case of Lord Janna. You know, fairly recently there was all the publicity about the way the police went and, and you know, trashed through the house and the lives and, you know, um, all of that. But would that have made the papers had it been 
a family on on a, on a sink estate in the middle of, of course Russia. not of course you know? not no. so I'm, I'm just trying to to say that it, there is one rule for one yeah. part of society and one rule for another and i i would like that to change maggie are they still coming up with this idea of uh, lifestyle choice do you, do you, do you recognise that from what I've said? Because that was around a long time ago in some of the care cases that I was involved in, and it it was it was mentioned, yeah. you know, that these are children, but that they, you know, they, it, it was their behaviour was somehow uh, allowed to continue because it was a lifestyle, was a lifestyle choice. Lifestyle choice they had made. They had made. Yes, the children yeah. had made. I think you'd be less likely to hear anybody. Um, any officials referring to that anymore right. but I think that the attitudes still prevail right. I do still think that um, amongst um, the police um, there are many people who feel that the that the victims of the grooming gangs somehow deserve it that they're asking for it um, and are not worthy of being protected and I don't think they would openly admit that but I think if you look at the but some of the cases that we're dealing with um, in the foundation, current cases, it's it's just as clear as the nose on your face that those attitudes are what are driving the um, the investigations, and many of these victims are still being dismissed and and fobbed off at the first hurdle. How, how do they come to like, you, Maggie? How do the, how do the people come to you these days? Yeah, how do they, they get in touch? Our, our, Go to our website www.themaggieoliverfoundation.com and if you go to contact us and there's a little box there that says you know i need help so whether that's help in being heard whether it's help um after a prosecution has failed whether you need um extra support whether you need somebody to listen to you because we we now have what we call a, our pain into power phone support service so somebody who is struggling on their own and, and even if they just want somebody to talk to um, we will match a victim up with one of our trained ambassadors and they can have an ongoing um, contact with them at the moment we're like once a week but we're starting to do group therapy for survivors beginning in May uh, 12 week courses so we're at the start of our journey but in the past couple of years we've helped almost 2,000 survivors so this isn't a problem that has gone away and it is not going to go away I mean um, and, and what proportion it, of those 2,000 Maggie are saying that this is still going on do you've got have you got any idea rather than it's a it's something that I, happened I, I mean we, we help survivors of all kinds of yeah child sexual, adult survivors so we could be helping somebody who's been abused by in the family home, uh, somebody who's been abused by the grooming gangs. But I've got, I mean, I have got some statistics, um, if you want them. So from the, uh, the Victims Commissioner, um, Vera Baird, she did a survey last year, and 86% of victims believed that they would not receive justice by reporting a crime to the police. That's 86%. Um, less than 1.7 percent of reported rapes ever end up in a prosecution at court wow so the these are and, and those people you know that that 98 percent of people who haven't received justice by reporting to the police they're a selection of those who come to us in desperation because you know it, it isn't always having a court case that can help somebody to recover it can often be just being heard, being yeah. believed. And at the foundation, we give them an opportunity as well to share their story. We share survivor stories anonymously, but the, the feedback that I get is, is just that even that alone can make a monumental difference. To know that they've been heard, you know, that they've been treated with respect, with kindness, with empathy. and. You know, as a, there are some very, very good police officers out there. I am not for one moment saying that every police officer is a bad person. I no. am not. Um, what I am saying is that those at the top need to get their act together and they need to send out the very clear message that for every case where there is evidence, 
we investigate and we we do what we can but we're honest with victims and if they you know when i was in the job if somebody came to me and said they had been raped i would never make any promises at the start because i didn't know where the evidence trail would lead to but what i would say is that i will do my very best and i would treat them you know as though they were a human being and with 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 respect and keep them in the picture and 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 at the end of that process if the evidence wasn't there and i felt even if it got to court that they would be hauled over the coals and you know and and massacred in in a in a witness box i would be honest with them and people generally can accept that if you are doing your best and you're being honest what they don't accept is when they're dismissed at the very first hurdle without even having the 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 courtesy of having their case investigated and i agree with you think. maggie i i found yeah. that as a, as a lawyer you could say some pretty um well you you could say a lot that that clients didn't want to hear but if they knew that you were saying it out of that wanting them to understand having heard their story yeah. they accepted it uh, um, and that you know it's it's important that people are listened to isn't it uh, i i think that that's what this is about it's about communication i think it's massively about trust mm. i personally feel that it isn't a police officer who should be the point of support for a victim i believe we should have a person who is dedicated allocated to that victim let the police get on and investigate let that because and and let a support person i mean if an isva or we, we're looking with the foundation i would like to offer that service ourselves as we as we grow but you know give that victim somebody that they can um, contact that they are in that they know they trust that they're supported by let the mm. police get on with the investigation well their because, job isn't really maggie to be a supporter is it their job is no, to isn't. gather the evidence and establish the truth and establish the truth and Absolutely. and being reasonable with people obviously yeah. not not yeah. demeaning them but but yeah. they have a different job and, and it's unwise i think of of lay people to think that the police are there doing a kind of social work job they're not i agree, mm. I agree but the, the the misconception is that a victim will be supported and the reality yeah. is that the police officer is running around like a you know headless a, chicken a, yeah the victim becomes the very last consideration yeah. in what is a, a phenomenally busy job but the victim doesn't go away and every single day they're waiting for news that might take months it might take years and they feel like the forgotten people yeah. in what actually is about them so have somebody who is that i mean it, on murders you know I, I worked in the murder incident team that was my job i didn't work in child protection um and i was also a family liaison officer my job on a murder was to keep the family updated to support them to go in there to talk to them mm. you need that with a, a, a victim of horrific abuse and that isn't there at the moment and that is what we need so why do you think it isn't maggie what what is that just I think a... it's like everything it comes down to money and resources yeah. and priorities and a victim once they have i i often describe a victim as a commodity because once they have given their victim statement once they have been recorded they become an afterthought and unless they're useful very often um, and repeatedly in the foundation, we have victims who have been and made a complaint of sexual abuse or grooming or rape to the police, and they've been dismissed and told that, you know, we're not taking this any further, there's not enough evidence. Two years down the road, somebody else makes a complaint against the same person, or they may have opened up a, a, a big investigation. Suddenly, that victim, who two years ago was unimportant, Mm. suddenly becomes flavor of the month they become a commodity they're useful again and and then you have to try and get them on side which must be difficult which which was my task on operation span in rochdale that's mm. exactly what i was asked to do with kids who had been dismissed two years before and then the the powers that be came to me that they headhunted me because i was you know i can be trusted and they begged and pleaded with me to get involved in that job, even though 
because of my experience in 2005, I, I didn't want to get involved. I didn't want to be in that position again of kids being failed. But I was given cast iron guarantees that there wouldn't be a repeat of Operation Augusta. And so I agreed to go out and try and recruit these children to tell us what had happened. And I was honest with them. I was truthful. But I had been told, because we knew what had happened, we'd got all the evidence. I had been promised that if these kids put their trust in me, because I was trusting those at the top, that I would be allowed to hold their hand right through the system. And then not only did they change their mind, they decided that um, that they were going to, you know, of the three dozen kids that we had on our on our list, that they were really going to build a case around one of them. So that, that's really what led to my um, resignation from the police, because... I could no longer trust what I was being told was was honest, was truthful, and I wasn't prepared to put myself into that position ever again. And I, those I, children I, had been abandoned again? Yeah, yeah, I mean, <sighs> they, they were just left to their own devices. And in fact, as anybody who's watched um, Three Girls will know, mm. you know, that the men that, that got young Ruby, she was 13 and this um, man got her pregnant when she had a termination, the police seized the fetus. It had been put in the property system and forgotten about for two years. I was tasked with going back to the family and saying, we have got this fetus. We can do DNA. We can find out exactly who this abuser is. We already knew, but we can prove it. So that child and her mum gave permission for us to do that, despite the fact that they didn't even know the police had the fetus. And then further down the road, um, not only did they change their mind, but that man who got her pregnant wasn't even charged with rape. He was out of prison in just over two years. So what He's was he charged them, with? Unlawful sexual intercourse? Or... Sexual activity with a child. Right. Um, and then two years ago, she's walking around the, the, the supermarket in Rochdale, round the end of an aisle, and she comes slap bang face to face with the guy who got her pregnant. She didn't even know he was out of prison. Probation hadn't hadn't um, consulted her about whether he should be considered for parole. You know, they are treated like pariahs. Um, and it, 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 it is wrong, but it makes my blood boil. And if I don't speak out about these things, it, in my mind, it makes me as bad as those who've turned the back. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, but it, it almost destroyed my own life. But I... I, because I they don't want to hear but you. you found a way of you found a way of moving forward, but it's very difficult for most people to find a way of moving forward, and they haven't got the wherewithal to organise themselves. They no, need some I, I help lost, from you. Yeah, you know, I I lost everything when I I, I lost my career, I lost mm. my income. I was a single mum with four children. I lost my home, but I wanted to be able to look myself in the mirror and know that I'd tried my best, and I was ashamed of what I was seeing. And, you know, for me, being a police officer came with certain commitments and and, um, and beliefs. And, and I no longer believed in the job I was being asked. I felt that I had been used. You know, well, you had. had you been had been, been used. Yeah, yeah I had, had been used. But so are many yeah. other police officers yeah. Yeah. who sure. had my rank. And for me, sure. I want accountability for those at the top, those who deliberately closed down jobs like Operation Augusta and allowed, you know, generations of kids to be thrown to the wolves and abused by the gang of a hundred men that we knew were abusing kids back in 2005. That is not right. And no. I, I'll say that, and you know, until I've got no breath in my body. I and agree with you, Maggie. Yeah. So somebody's got to say it. But when I left, yeah. the, when I left Greater Manchester Police, it was a terrifying journey. You know, I, I was threatened with prison. I thought I would be prosecuted for... What, for, two, speaking, for speaking? For speaking yeah, out? For, spe for speaking out in writing and verbally. You know, everything I knew as a, as a police officer was secret. You know, I was not supposed to share that with the public. I went to my federation and they turned their back on me. Um, I was threatened verbally, in writing, and I... I was really, really scared. I was, it's a huge you know, price to pay for trying to speak up for people who don't have a voice. So is, is really that a, should we learn that that's a warning not to do it? Or should no, we learn I, that actually people need to see that you survive it and it's uh, the right thing to do for your 
self-respect and um, I, I peace think, of mind as well. I, I think it's a, I think it's a, a really, really, really difficult. It was, it's been the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. Mm. And the, the problem is when when you take that leap into the unknown. It, it's first of all, it's very lonely um, because mm. I didn't know anybody who I could talk to, um, mm. and I am probably my my character means that I do fight for what I believe in. I, I've got better at it, but taking the first step is very scary because you don't know where that. Yeah, you're happens. jumping off a cliff, aren't you? You're jumping you off a cliff, and mm. somehow I've managed to get through through the the. I've managed to navigate the, 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 the problems and touch the nerve amongst ordinary people who feel yeah. the same way. Yeah. But what I do believe is that whistle, because I now I know I'm a whistleblower. You're a whistleblower, but yeah. Yeah, but I do feel that whistleblowers should be protected. Um, I didn't know where to go. I'm, I'm working with um, Whistleblowers UK to try and bring in an office for the whistleblower so that whatever... Um, whether it's the NHS or the police, somebody who has got legitimate, truthful um, mm. concerns like I had has somewhere to go. Because I didn't want to leave my job. I did mm. not for one moment at the start believe that the chief constable knew that what I was saying was true. I thought I was telling him something he didn't know. I, I was that naive. Mm. You know, oh my God, mm. what I You were learned. doing your job, Maggie. You were doing the job that you should do. Yeah. It's well, unbelievable I that... I was naive. I was well, we naive want to help people to know. So speaking like this does help people to understand what yeah. you can do and that there is a way yeah, There is a way forward and people need to unite to work yeah, together unite. to um, yeah. be more powerful. Yeah. Yes, it's I, extraordinary I, yeah. what I think you've knowledge, been through. I think knowledge is power. I think mm. there is strength in numbers. And I believe that we all we actually have at the end of the day is our voice. Yeah. And we have to stand by what we believe, however scary that is. I know had I not stood up for what I believed in, if, if I'd stayed in my job, I, I, as I was told by one of my supervisors, listen, Maggie, this is above your pay grade. Come to work, <laughs> do your job, put your bum on the seat, get your wage and go home. Um, but I couldn't do that. And all I had was my voice to say what I believed in. But had I not spoken out, I would have been seen as a loose cannon. I would have been seen as a danger. GMP would have stuck me in a back end job in a in an office, and I would have I would have gone under. But yes, you wouldn't win that you way. Win. You don't win that way. But you don't. But, it, but it, it, it at least this gives a. Well, I mean, we're trying to give people a voice to talk uh, and you yeah. know and as much as we can do that we contribute our bit to giving a voice and trying to get people to unite but I think we need to thank you Maggie for the time to give us so much valuable information it's yeah. really tremendous yeah. to speak to you and you're a very brave woman Maggie mm. or stupid <laughs> <laughs> the, let the world decide that one <laughs> yeah, I mean I, I've had a little look at your, your, your app you know and I'd like to talk to you about that uh, oh, we'd you know, be delighted. Because I, I think gathering evidence is it's crucial. Key, is yeah. crucial, and helping people to do that in whatever way they can, I think, is critical. Well, um, we're in the evidence on, business, yeah, yeah, with you. And and you I saying that though will have a huge impact because other people will will take that seriously. I'm sure. Yeah, I, I think um, I think what I've learned is that you know we c we can say things you know like with the foundation i know just like you've just asked me um how many of those 2000 survivors were from which ethnicity which from from here from what background we have just put together we have bought and built our own crm system because nowhere is that is that information is that evidence recorded by the statutory authorities right mm. and you have to question why yeah, why Tied. would they not gather that information? So mm. we in the foundation have begun to gather our own. And I mm. feel the same with a with a victim who is fobbed off by the authorities. Gather your own evidence. Yeah, you, know, you have put to do your it. Your case together. You know, record it. Make sure it's contemporaneous while it's fresh in your mind. And when you have got that, 
then it's far, far more difficult to fob them off. You know, and, so I think... It's... I've got to say, this is these, these are the words of a detective. And if we can't rely on the words of a detective to know what the job is, then... You know, we really need to listen to you, and that's why I, well, I think the app is important. But the app yeah. is important because it really, it's about evidence. Without evidence, yeah. you are really stuck, Absolutely. aren't you? Hundred yeah. percent. And you know, that, that's what I. That's what we say to to victims. You know, the evidence may not be there for a prosecution, but evidence is the key. And without evidence, you don't stand a cat in hell's chance with with the criminal justice system you know you can have all the the words in the world but if you can't back it up with evidence then you, you're never going to get anywhere and and really if you go to the authorities and they don't search out for that evidence you are still in a very uh, very weak position so do the best you can to gather your own point them in the right direction don't take no for an answer if you get a, an NFA decision, a no further action decision, you can challenge that. You have a right to review. Yeah. You know, come to us at the foundation. We will point you in the right direction. But, you know, don't suffer in silence. You know, we'll help if we can. And really, we need to grow an army of people like us who, you know, I believe in the law. I believe in justice. And I also believe in what is right and what's wrong. And mm -hmm. at the moment, it is wrong that the authorities are making decisions based on resources and money and funding and what's easy to do. And, and that isn't what I want in, in a society. No. So, and it isn't no. fair. It isn't and fair it isn't on all fair. the people. No. no. So, well, wise words is all wise I can words say. Very wise words, Maggie. We'd, we'd love to come back and talk to you again, perhaps about evidence gathering in more specific terms. Yeah. Definitely. Also to hear more about what's happening from you. Thank you very much. Thank Maggie. you very much. Yeah, thank you for having me on. I've enjoyed speaking to you.